Way up north there's an island out in the sea And way out there they've got neural networks and their cool StatQuest Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to StatQuest. Today we're going to talk about Neural Networks Part 4, Multiple Inputs and Outputs. Note, this StatQuest was supported in part by Ital. Also, I thought I'd mention that the inspiration for this StatQuest came from my friend Michael in Svalbard. Lastly, this StatQuest assumes that you already understand the main ideas behind neural networks and the ReLU activation function. If not, check out the quests. The links are in the description below. So far, the neural networks that we've looked at have been super simple and only predict whether or not the dosage of a drug will be effective. The neural networks just have one input node and one output node. When there is only one input node, then the data we are using to make predictions in this case, dosages, can all fit on the x-axis of this graph. In other words, the input is one-dimensional, since it only needs one axis in the graph. Likewise, a single dimension, the y-axis, represents the output values. Combined, we get a two-dimensional graph with the input, dosage, on the x-axis, and the output, drug effectiveness, on the y-axis. Because the input and output combine to form a two-dimensional graph, we can see how the weights and biases in this neural network slice, flip, and stretch the curved or bent activation functions into new shapes that are added together to make a two-dimensional squiggle or shape that fits the data. Pip, 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 bam. Now let's look at a more complicated network that has more than one input node and more than one output node. Now, this neural network may look really fancy, but all it does is take two measurements from an iris flower, the width of a petal, which is this part of the flower, and the width of a sepal, which is this part of the flower. And with that information, it predicts the species, either setosa, versicolor, or virginica. Now, raise your hand if you already knew that this was a sepal and not a petal. Not me. I thought they were all petals. Anyway, to keep things simple at the start, let's begin with both input nodes, but just one output node for setosa. Later on, we'll add the other two output nodes, but for now, let's keep things simple and just use one output node. Now let's see what happens when we plug values for petal width and sepal width into this simplified neural network. Since we have two inputs and one output, if we're going to draw a graph of what's going on, then we need a three-dimensional graph. The inputs, petal width and sepal width, each get an axis. And the output, the prediction for setosa, gets the y-axis. Note, to keep the math simple, I scaled the inputs to be between 0 for the smallest value and 1 for the largest value. So let's start in this corner where petal and sepal width equal 0 and plug those values into the neural network. First, let's determine the x-axis coordinate for the top node in the hidden layer. We multiply the petal width by the weight associated with the connection to the top node in the hidden layer, negative 2.5, and we multiply the sepal width by the weight associated with its connection to the top node in the hidden layer, 0.6. Then we add the two terms together, and add the bias, 1.6, and that gives us the x-axis coordinate for the activation function, which is 1.6. Now we plug 1.6 into the ReLU activation function to get the y-axis coordinate 1.6, because 1.6 is greater than 0. And 1.6 corresponds to this blue point on the graph when petal and sepal widths are both 0. Now let's increase petal width to 0.2, but keep sepal width at 0. 
Now, when we do the math, we get 1.1 for the x-axis coordinate and 1.1 for the y-axis coordinate. And 1.1 corresponds to this blue point on the graph. Likewise, when we increase pedal width to the maximum value, 1, but keep sepal width at 0, we get these blue dots. Now let's increase sepal width to 0 0.2 and run values for pedal width from 0 to 1 through the neural network. Likewise, if we keep increasing sepal width to 1 for different values of pedal width, we get this blue bent surface. The bend corresponds to the points where the ReLU activation function set the y-axis values to 0. Now we multiply the y-axis value for each point by negative 0.1. For example, the original y-axis value for this point, when pedal and sepal widths are both 0, is 1.6. And 1.6 times negative 0.1 equals negative 0.16. So the final point is here. Likewise, when we multiply all of the other y-axis coordinates by negative 0.1, we get this final blue bent surface. Now we do the exact same thing for the connections to the bottom node in the hidden layer. And we end up with this orange bent surface where the bend occurs where the ReLU activation function set the y-axis values to zero. Then we multiply each y-axis coordinate by 1.5 to get the final orange bent surface. Now we add the y-axis coordinates on the blue bent surface to the y-axis coordinates on the orange bent surface. For example, the y-axis coordinate for this blue point is negative 0.16. And we add the y-axis coordinate for this orange point, 1.05. To get 0.89, the y axis coordinate for this green point. Anyways, we do that for every single point, and ultimately, we end up with this green crinkled surface. Now, the last thing we do is add the final bias, 0, to each y axis coordinate. And since adding 0 doesn't change the green crinkled surface, this is the output for Setosa. Bam! Looking at the green crinkled surface, we see that the value for Setosa is highest when the pedal width is close to zero. And the value for Setosa is lowest when the pedal width is close to one. Note, remember that we scaled the inputs to be between zero and one. And thus, pedal width equals zero does not imply that the pedal is zero centimeters wide. Instead, Zero refers to the smallest width in the training dataset. Likewise, one means the largest width in the training dataset. Small BAM. Now, to review the concept so far, when we have two inputs, the neural network creates curved or bent surfaces that are added together to make a new crinkled surface. That, in this case, we can use to make predictions about whether or not the species of an iris is setosa. For example, if we found this iris while walking in the woods, and the scaled petal width was 0.5, and the scaled sepal width was 0.37, then we can look at the y-axis value on the green crinkled surface that corresponds to these measurements, and see that this particular iris is probably not setosa because the y-axis value is closer to zero than one. And this is confirmed when we run the numbers through the neural network and get 0 0.09. Bam. Now that we have a green crinkled surface for setosa, let's determine the output for the second species, fursi color. Just like before, we'll start with the connections to the top node in the hidden layer. And because the weights and biases are the same as before, we start out with the same blue bent surface. However, because we will multiply the y-axis coordinates by 2.4, let's change the range of the y-axis from 0 to 2 to negative 6 to 6. Bam. Now, 
multiplying the y-axis coordinates by 2.4 gives us this final blue bent surface. Now we create the orange bent surface from the bottom node in the hidden layer and multiply the y-axis coordinates on the orange bent surface by negative 5.2. Now we add the y-axis coordinates from the two bent surfaces together to create this red crinkled surface. Lastly, we add the final bias, 0, to the y-axis coordinates on the red crinkled surface, and that gives us the final surface for predicting if the iris species is versicolor. Now, I'll admit, it's hard to see what values for petal or sepal widths will give versicolor a high score on this red crinkled surface. But when we change the y-axis scale from negative 6 to 6, to negative 0.5 to 1, we see that when petal width is close to 0.4, we will get a high value for versicolor. Double bam! Now, just like we did for setosa and versicolor, Let's determine the crinkled surface for virginica. Just like before, we start with the blue bent surface from the top node in the hidden layer. But now we multiply the y-axis coordinates by negative 2.2. And just like before, we create the orange bent surface from the bottom node in the hidden layer. But now we multiply the y-axis coordinates by 3.7. Now we add the y-axis coordinates from the two bent surfaces together and get this purple crinkled surface. Lastly, we add the final bias, 1, to the y-axis coordinates on the purple crinkled surface. And that gives us the final surface for predicting if the iris species is virginica. Now, so we can see what's going on, let's change the scale for the y-axis from negative 6 to 6 to 0 to 1. Now we see that when petal width is close to 1, then we will get a high score for virginica. Triple bam! At long last, we have crinkled surfaces for setosa, versicolor, and virginica. Now we can plug in the petal and sepal widths from the iris we found, and run the numbers through the neural network and predict that this iris is versicolor because that output value, 0.86, is closest to 1. That said, usually when there are two or more output nodes, the output values are sent to either something called argmax, arg, or something called softmax before a final decision is made. And we'll talk about argmax and softmax in the next stat quest in this series. Bam! Now it's time for some shameless self-promotion. If you want to review statistics and machine learning offline, check out the StatQuest study guides at statquest.org. There's something for everyone. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to support StatQuest, consider contributing to my Patreon campaign, becoming a channel member, buying one or two of my original songs, or a t-shirt, or a hoodie, or just donate. The links are in the description below. Alright, until next time, quest on!